You're listening to the Healthy Creative Ministry Podcast with Matt Curtis. This is the podcast that helps you take your creative ministry from wherever you are today to healthy and effective. Is this mission critical or personal preference? This is one that I have wrestled with for a lot of my career. I actually got this question emailed to me this week. What do I do with preference? How do I navigate these preference or pet projects, as I like to call them, when ministry leaders come to me and ask me or my team to be investing in projects that just aren't projects that move the mission forward? What are we supposed to do with that? How are we supposed to address that? Well, in my time in ministry, I have actually encountered this in a lot of different ways. And the the conclusion that I've come to is actually a little bit of humble pie. <laughs> so I want to share a story with you that really was kind of the, the, the catalyst for me understanding this. But first, I want to give you some context in terms of, of, of maybe a, a relatable hook. I don't know. So early in my career, I was, I was a couple years out of college serving at a church, and a ministry leader came up to me and asked me to design a flyer for an event that they were putting on in their ministry. So I went through some of the common questions that any creative would ask. Who are you trying to reach with this? You know, who's your target audience? How many people are you expecting or, or even wanting to respond to this? So this was a volunteer oriented promotion. We need volunteers for this event. And I remember the answer really kind of stopped me in my tracks. We need five volunteers. And I remember thinking to myself, five? Okay, why don't you just call five people or call 10 people if you have a 50% conversion rate or, or call 15 people? You know, I mean, we could keep going here, but I don't understand why you're coming to me to design something for this promotion when you only need five volunteers. The reality was that this was not a difficult problem to solve and it didn't require kind of the uh, the horsepower of communications or of design or, or any of that kind of stuff. It didn't need formal promotion. This was a small enough project where you could handle this on your own. So that was the, the very beginning of me being exposed to this idea of preference. And it really became a frustration of mine over the years because I had this attitude and perception that most of what ministry leaders wanted wasn't actually important, wasn't actually significant to the to the ministry at hand but they were preference projects they were the the way that i would say it early in my career before <laughs> before god had uh, <laughs> transformed my mind and my thinking a little bit on these things i would say my job is not to design something for your scrapbook my job is to design something to engage a group of people whether that be growing in their faith through you know a, a study a class joining a small group, serving in ministry, giving, or my job is to engage culture in a way that moves them to the point where they're interested in having a conversation about God in a way that they haven't before. Those are the things that you need to bring me into. Not, I have this event for five people and I want you to design something for it. So, so this was the beginning. And you may relate to this. You may feel like a lot of the projects that are being uh, given to you, a lot of things that you're being asked to execute on, they, they just aren't clear connects when it comes to moving the mission of your church forward. And, and that may be true, but this is the story that really transformed it for me. And I want to share it with you. I've mentioned it before on the podcast, but it truly was the catalyst for me in understanding that I don't understand everything. This question of, is it mission critical or personal preference? The short answer here is, I have no idea. And there's a good chance that you don't either. And that's why I think this is an important question to answer. Because when we get into the mindset of policing the validity of the, the requests that are coming to us from ministry leaders, we actually put ourselves in a really unhelpful position for the rest of the organization. So the, the story, the, the situation that happened to me, a ministry leader approaches me and said, Matt, we really want to do this, this fancy plaque type of thing for parent-child dedications. So this is what we did in our church. We didn't do uh, infant baptism. We did uh, basically dedications. And so that, that, that was the, the thing that we were trying to commemorate. And so part of that was a class for parents to help them understand what they were doing in the process of uh, you know, committing to raise their kids in a way that honors God. And then 
the kid isn't really kind of, I mean, the kid's involved in the sense that they're being raised in the home, but this really is something for the parents. So this was something that the team was investing in, really trying to help parents understand this, understand the partnership that, that the church was wanting to have with them, but also helping them as parents understand this is your responsibility. Like, this isn't just to outsource spiritual growth and development to, to the church, but it's participate as Christ followers in raising your kids. Lean into that, own it, and then recognize we, the church, are in your corner, and we will help equip and prepare you to do that. So they really wanted to make this big celebration, and, and they wanted to commemorate it with this really like, almost like a plaque with a photo and have it, you know, custom matted and like, it was a real fancy piece. And I just remember, I kind of, I kind of lost it. <laughs> I didn't start yelling at anybody, but like internally I lost it. And I just remember thinking to myself, I am underwater right now. I am so busy with so many different things on my to-do list. And I'm having a conversation about custom photos or, or custom matting photos and plaques for, I just, I don't understand. Like there wasn't this major initiative in our church to say we really want to do this and embrace this. This was just a random project that felt like it was over-engineered, like, like you would not believe. Just, I couldn't even fathom how much work was being created. That was what was going on inside my mind. And so I was very fortunate to have a boss that was gracious and, and let me uh, air my grievances, if you will. And so he, he said, look, let's have a conversation, you know, get out your frustration. So I, you know, kind of lamented with him. And at the end of it, you know, as I'm, as I'm struggling with this, one of the things that I always value is understanding because even though I'm frustrated, even though I do not think this is a good idea, even though I see really no significant merit whatsoever, I do acknowledge that I could be wrong. And so for me, it's very important to ask this final question anytime we're frustrated. Hey, what am I missing? Like, is there some reason that I'm wrong? Like, it's so obvious to me that this doesn't make any sense. What's not obvious to me? What am I missing? Because I don't assume that the people around me are all idiots. <laughs> I don't assume that for a moment. If anything, I assume that I'm serving alongside people that are called to be in the ministry that they're in. God has, has equipped them and or is in the process of equipping them to do the work of ministry that he's called them into. So I'm not dismissing that, it, that they don't have any good ideas or that they're incompetent, not at all. But I don't see it. I don't get it. And so I asked my boss that question. And he came back with a really kind and gracious response. He said, you know, Matt, one of the things we find is that parenting is hard. And when we make a commitment as parents, sometimes we lose sight of that. Sometimes we forget that we've made that commitment. Or sometimes the circumstances of life just get in the way and distract us from the thing that we were trying to accomplish. Like, okay, I'm on board so far. So something that we have seen to be valuable, or at least the idea behind this, is what if we can create something that's nice enough for these parents who are making these decisions so that they will keep it? And then in the midst of these different seasons of life, these different circumstances in which they are facing challenges and hardships, they see that thing that's hanging up in their wall or that, you know, that plaque or that framed thing that's sitting up on a, you know, on the mantle or wherever, wherever they decide to put it. What if that's the thing that helps remind them of the commitment that they've made? And I just remember sitting there and I was in my cubicle. I'm looking back at him and I just remember thinking to myself, unbelievable. I cannot believe that I missed the potential value of this request so much I'm not even saying you have to adopt this approach to ministry. I'm not saying that you have to agree that this is an extremely worthwhile and, and valuable and important approach. You may not. This may not be the kind of thing that you're like, yeah, our church would never do that. That's fine. But what is very clear is that whoever it is that came to the table with this idea, they had a reason behind it. And not a, I think this will be super neat kind of idea, but they had a bigger ministry-minded idea. This was a solution for the purpose of ministry. 
the goal with this project was to help families continue to embrace the, the commitment that they've made to raise their kids in a godly way. That's very important and that's very legitimate. And so what I realized in that encounter and in that conversation was that I actually don't think that I'm the right person to be evaluating if all of these things are mission critical or if they are personal preference. And my challenge to you, or maybe even my, my claim here, is I don't think that you're the right person to make that decision either. So that puts us in a little bit of a complicated situation. Does that mean we're just supposed to blindly do everything? No. Does that mean we're supposed to say no to everything? No, of course not. That's, a, that's even farther than what I started this with. But there is a process that I think we should be going through when it comes to evaluating and assessing this stuff because ultimately, we do need to have clarity here. We can't just go off and do all of these preference projects. That's not, a, that's not a legitimate solution. That's not an effective use of tithe dollars, which, by the way, if you're employed by a church, you're being paid with the tithes of the people in your congregation, the tithes and offerings. We want to be good stewards of that. They aren't tithing so that we can just do pet projects. They're tithing because, well, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the things that we should be cognizant of is in the context of these tithes coming in, we should be moving the mission of the church forward. We should be focusing on the ministry of the church. Rather than us sitting in our cubicles or sitting at our desks and thinking to ourselves, these five projects are super dumb and I don't want to do them, or this project over here is the only one that matters. I want to separate that idea as something that's not a part of your job, but instead... I want to introduce a way of thinking about this stuff that I think can be really helpful at addressing this tension of is it mission critical or is it personal preference? This is how I would suggest navigating this tension. It's important to delineate that there really are only two different types of things that happen in the church. There's event promotion and there's event support. And I'm going to break that down because event is a, it's a loaded term anymore. Think of everything that your church does as an event. So a weekend service, that's an event. A small group gathering, that's an event. Uh, a ministry that's, that's you know, doing something midweek, that's an event. Everything that your church is doing, just consider an event just for the sake of this conversation. And so event promotion is letting people know about those things. And then event support is what is necessary to facilitate this event. So event promotion hey, on Thursday at two o'clock, we're doing this. That's event promotion. Event support is I'm going to need 50 pens. I'm going to need 100 sheets of notes. That's support. The notes are support. Those are the kinds of things that the event requires in order to actually happen. This is the same thing as if you're having a buffet. Plates, <laughs> that's event support. Uh, food to go on the plates. That's event support. So think through the ministry requests that you're getting. How many of them are the communications ministry being asked to promote an event? Hey, this is happening. Be aware of it. Get it on your calendars. Here's how you sign up. Versus, hey, I need another packet of notes here. Hey, we have a study guide that we're going to be going through. Hey, we need to have this to give to our parents when their kids are leaving. So those are the two different categories. And the reason this is important is because typically what happens is a communications ministry is started with the purpose of trying to help a church communicate effectively to the outside world. Hey, we really want to make sure that our community understands certain things. We want to understand that our, our congregation understands certain things. We have a lot going on and we need somebody to be air traffic control. Hey, we want to make sure that our graphics are up to a, you know, a little higher standard than they currently are right now because we want to make sure that we're presenting things in a way that's compelling. Yes, it's for our internal congregation, but this is event promotion. We want to promote the things that we're doing and we want to invest a little bit more energy in those things. Okay, that's great. But what happens over time is the kids ministry needs another laminated place card to put on table seven because little Johnny ate it again. Like those are the types of things that we are actually getting dragged into. And a lot of this happens innocently. A lot of this happens because 
ministry leaders look around and they say, we're spending a lot of time on our place cards, but they don't look very good. It would be so nice if the comm ministry could speak into this. Hey, can a graphic designer improve this and make it better? The answer is yes, absolutely a graphic designer can. And if you give them the project, they will. The issue, however, is that anytime the communications ministry is focusing on event support, that means you have to say no to event promotion. The biggest problem in that is that event promotion is no longer happening because event support is taking up all of our time. There was a time for me where about 80% of the energy we were spending as a communications team was spent on event support, not on event promotion. And that meant that we were getting less recognized in the community. And I don't mean like we weren't winning awards. I mean, we were not known in a way that we should be known by those who are outside the church that they should consider coming to church. It meant that some of the events that were good events for our congregation weren't clearly communicated or effectively communicated because we were spending all of our time internally on event support. And I think there's value in us spending time on event support, but only if we're staffed or resourced that way. So when you assess the workload that you have on your team, you personally, if you're a team of one, or if you're managing a team, the things that your team are, are executing on, what's the percentage breakdown? Are you spending most of your time on things that are supporting the, the events that are happening? Or are you sup- spending most of your time supporting the exposure of those events to the people that you want to know about them? That's really the big drift that happens over time. And the reason this is relevant is because mission critical and personal preference are code for us to say, this isn't going to help more people know about it. And you want your event to be as effective as possible. So neither one of those are bad. But when you look at what the role of calm is, the role of calm isn't actually to make sure that your events go well. That's not the role of calm, not at all. That's the role of the ministry leader. That's the role of whoever it is that's putting on the events. It's not the role of calm. And if it becomes the role of calm, then nobody's talking to the community. Nobody's talking to the congregation about these events that are coming up. So here's what I would suggest in terms of getting this under control. And and I know that this is, um, it's kind of a, a longer unpacking of the problem itself or the question itself. And the reason it is, is because this is a very nuanced and complicated problem. And so I really appreciated actually this email coming in because it really forced me to navigate some of this tension. We say mission critical. And what we mean is this isn't exposure. We also say personal preference, but really what we mean is it's not helping exposure. So it's not like there's a bunch of rogue ministry leaders that have bad events. It's that our time and our energy is misplaced. So this is the strategy that I like to implement when it comes to figuring out how to solve this. The first thing here is to align with leadership. You need to make sure that they understand what you are resourced to be able to accomplish. And I really find that this supporting events versus promoting events is a really helpful way to explain this tension. The way I like to say it is we are not resourced staff-wise to be able to support all of the events that we're doing as a church without limit. Because the more we support events, the less gets communicated internally and externally. So what you're asking leadership to help you with is help me devise a strategy or even acknowledge that this is the desire that you want calm to be focusing on communicating internally and externally. Is that the role that you want us to play? Or do you want us to primarily print notes for ministry leaders and, you know, do laminated table signs or, you know, those types of things? Where is it that you want us to be investing our energy? It's important to understand that some ministry leaders might actually say to you, we want our ministries to be refined. And so we want you to focus on support. I love it. But ask them this question in response. If we aren't promoting events, then who is instead of us? 
That's a very important question to find an answer to. I actually find it really helpful to think about it this way. If calm isn't communicating, then no one is. But if calm isn't supporting events, the ministry leaders, other staff members, or volunteers are supporting those events. So this is the big tension. If calm gets pulled into these things, it means that it's creating a a vacuum. There's a hole now and nobody else is stepping into it. Whereas if calm is not investing in supporting events at the same level, then there's a bunch of people who can step into that. Align with leadership. Help me understand where you want our breakdown to be. Do you want us to be supporting ministries or do you want us to be communicating effectively to the outside world and to our congregation about the things that are coming? Once you've had that alignment conversation, it's time to land on a plan. That's the second step here. Land on a plan. I personally think it's reasonable to allocate a certain number of hours toward an event. You can support these major promotions with a certain number of you know things. You, you may even say to them, look, you're one of the big events, and so you're going to get unlimited support. The, you know, One of the churches that I worked at, we, we had a, tr- a trunk or treat. So that's a huge event. It's both a, mini- a mission win, but also it's a heavy internal support type of event. Well, okay, that's a big one. That's a valuable one. Full support, 100% access. We're going to do everything that you need to do. That's great. But then on some of these other events that you're supporting, limit it. Maybe it's, you know, you're only going to get two hours or you're only going to get one project. If you want notes, fine, we can do notes, but that's it. We're not going to do a bunch of other things for you. By limiting it, what you're doing is you're making it clear that you support them, but you're also making it clear that you can't support them in an unlimited way. I'm actually a huge, huge fan of putting this as a piece of what you do in your promotional plan. So I'll put a link to the promotional plan if you haven't already heard about it. I feel like that's the thing that people ask most about on Facebook. So you've probably seen me post (laughs) a million times about it simply because this is a very common need in the church. So if you can articulate on your promotional plan, look, mega events, these are our big mission movers. This, you you get full access to our team. We'll do everything. And then you have this other tier. It's like, you know what? You're going to get some support, not a ton, but some. And then you have another support. All support of the event happens internally. Calm doesn't even touch it. Clarify that. Land on a plan. Once you have your plan, once you've decided this, this is the way we want to handle it, this is the way that, that we're going to, you know, these are the rules. <laughs> these are the rules that we're going to make. Whatever they are, just, just define them. Make that clear. So once you have that plan, now it's time to formalize it. However it is that you inform ministry leaders, this information needs to get communicated to them. What I have found to be the most effective is to go to the different ministry leaders, the point person for each of the different ministry initiatives that exist in your church, have a conversation with them one-on-one. Unpack for them what's going on. Let them know that you value them, that you value their ministry. Ask them if they have any questions. Ask them for any concerns that they have. Really take the time to understand the, the good things and the bad things in terms of their response to this and, and their view of it. And then I would also identify individuals that I anticipate will be frustrated. There were always specific people that were particular about certain things. And I could usually tell if I was going to create a new policy, a new practice, a new strategy, I could guess who was going to be on the list of most frustrated. So I would actually go to them and have this conversation with them so that I could help them in a one-on-one way, regardless of their position in the organization. This could range from the senior pastor's not gonna like it, so I'm gonna have a conversation, all the way down to the part-time receptionist who only answers calls isn't gonna like it. Great, I'm gonna have a conversation with them as well. Doesn't matter where you are in the org chart, in the process of formalizing the plan, you're caring for people through change. That's what you're doing with this. You've aligned with leadership. You're both on the same page. Matt, we understand that the primary need we have for you as a comm team, we want you to be communicating externally and to our congregation. That's what we want. We understand that means you're going to support a ministry less. Great. Support ministry less, and we will figure out how to deal with that. Okay. Align with leadership. Land on a plan. All right. We've come up with a good plan. This is what it looks like for us to support you. Formalize the plan. All right. We've had our conversations with the different people who need to hear it. We've cared well for them through the process. Now you support ministry leaders. You equip them for success. This could be things like a Canva plan. 
Everybody in the organization gets access to Canva. We have your brand assets already loaded in there. We're going to train you every month. We're going to have you know, a lunch and learn. We're going to swing by your desk. We're going to have a one-on-one meeting, whatever. Whatever the strategy is that works best. Uh, we're going to you know, teach you design basics. We're going to give you a list of approved vendors. We're going to vet the vendors ahead of time. And we're going to say, if you need to order something, you can do it. We're going to spin up our own merch shop with the church shop. We're going to spin it up and you can add products that way. Or you can do, you know, whatever. Whatever it is that it looks like for you to support your ministry leaders now as you're doing this, what you're doing is you're allowing them to really invest in what you thought was personal preference, but actually turns out to be mission critical. See, that's what's so important about this is when we sit at our desks and we just judge something as personal preference and shut it down. If we're wrong, we're actually saying no to something that moves the mission forward. And that's not at all what we're supposed to be doing. So as you support your ministry leaders, you're allowing these initiatives to continue to breathe just somebody else is going to execute. And then the last thing that I would do is I would check in with ministry leaders. Every three to six months probably depends on the volume of work they're producing. You know, in my mind, I think back to specific contexts where the students team and the kids team, they're probably going to want to be checked in with every three months just because they're going to be doing a lot. Hey, everything working okay? Any hiccups, any problems, any way I can be helpful? And then things like, you know, men's ministry uh, probably don't need to check in quite as often. It's just not as many events, a couple big events, but just not the common, like every month or every week in some cases, that, that's just not the, the routine there. So you don't have to check in as often, but do evaluate, make sure that these things are working and, and make sure that you're supporting these different ministry leaders as effectively as possible. What we're trying to do is we're trying to recognize that we're not always going to get it right. If we label something as preference, that's just not always going to be right. We're not always going to call it like it's like it is. And so to have the humility to operate in a way that says, look, I don't get it. I don't see the benefit, the need, the value, but I'm going to empower you and equip you to be able to do this anyway. Now, as you go through this list, you may think to yourself, leadership may tell me, yeah, just support all the events and don't worry about promotion externally. Okay. So now you know what leadership wants you to do. That's it. I personally don't believe that that's setting communications up to be as effective as it could be in your organization. But if that is a desired need for the organization, and that is one that leadership has hired you to accomplish, then you have crystal clear vision around what your job is supposed to be. So now, rather than following the next steps, <laughs> you, you still need the land of plan. It'll just look totally different. But now operate with that in mind. Okay. So then what do we do to effectively support the ministry leaders that we have and the ministries that they're trying to execute on? What does that look like? Typically, it looks like more staff. Typically, it looks like partnering with an outsourced company on a certain thing or, or on a couple different things. You know, In my mind, I think hire somebody to help you with marketing, hire some people to help you with design, you know, hire some external people for different you know, things. But you can still build a plan you can still formalize the plan. You can still support ministry leaders and you can still evaluate. So don't let that first alignment conversation throw you off if leadership goes in a different direction. I had one conversation uh, in my career where I was really pitching the strategic value of communications. Senior pastor responded and said, man, I love it. These all sound like great ideas as long as the ministry leaders are happy. And I remember sort of losing my breath a little bit. Whoa, I'm sorry, What? <laughs> If all, assuming the ministry leaders are happy, what does that mean? Well, we've hired you to support them in the things that they need to get done. So your job is to support them and help them get everything done that needs to get done. So if you can do all of that and do these other things, I think that's great. Oh, oh, you don't want us to be strategic. Well, it's not that we don't want you to, it's that we didn't hire you for that. That's not why we brought you on the team. And that's not our expectation of what you do. This is our expectation that you support events and support ministry and essentially do as the ministry leaders ask you to do. Okay. I had a lot of tension until I acknowledged that that's actually what they were asking me to do. And once I acknowledged it, everything changed. I was able to build a way more effective team. 
everybody was more content. Everyone was happier. <laughs> Our relationships got better. But when you fight it, it's just not going to work. So once you align with leadership, obviously listen to what they're saying and then build a plan accordingly. But either way, it's not your job to decide what is mission critical and what is personal preference. So I want to bring that up because I know that this is a very common question. Um, and I know for me, even in my own career, that was one that plagued me for a really long time. But it's very important for us to navigate it and to lean into it. Because once we do, it can change a lot about the health of our ministry. And that is how I would answer the question. Is this mission critical or is this personal preference? Thanks for listening to this episode of the Healthy Creative Ministry Podcast. This podcast is just one of the ways Lunchtime Heroes can help you build a healthy creative ministry in your church. Stay up to date on the latest by signing up for the Creative Bites email at lunchtimeheroes.co. 